Hey guys, welcome to Rotor Ride. I'm Ladrib, and this is Tyler, aka Groose FPV, a AK, the general manager of our retail operations here at Rotor Riot. What's up, guys? And uh, I asked Tyler to be here today because, in addition to being a badass pilot and keeping a lot of things here running, he's also responsible for making the configurations and the tunes for all of the drones that we build here. Yeah, no, I go through all of our builds, and uh, each one of them I build up a a tune from the ground up, starting from scratch. There's a lot to do uh, on a flight controller in beta flight. A flight controller is the brain of the operations. Everything on your drone goes through the flight controller. It has to talk to uh, different accessories you've put. It has to talk to uh, the other components that you've put on your drone, like your air unit, your receiver, maybe your GPS. It has to send the signal to the ESCs to power the motor. It has the gyro that's responsible for measuring the position of the drone relative to the position it's supposed to be at and calculating that correction and doing everything that makes a drone actually fly. So today we're gonna walk you through a setup from scratch because a new version of Betaflight just came out. Correct, Betaflight 4.3 is officially released. We actually featured a release candidate of 4.3 in an earlier build video, so we've covered a little bit of this before. And we've done videos like this before doing Betaflight setup, but with every version, a little bit changes, and if you've never done it before, uh, we just wanted to make this to completely walk you through what all the different settings in beta flight do, what you need to know to set up a flight controller from scratch. That being said, you don't need to do this. If you've bought a drone from us that flies, you don't need to go in there. I would say 80% of the issues anyone has with one of our drones is because they've plugged it in and flashed it or changed the setting or something, and it's like, you don't need to do that, just, just fly it. But if you're trying to enjoy the aspect of the hobby, which is building your own drones, or if you're doing a repair, or if you wanna put on a new flight control, or if you really do just wanna learn what's entailed with this, come along, because we're gonna break it all down for you. First thing you're gonna need is the Betaflight configurator. So we'll leave a link in the description to download the latest Betaflight configurator. Uh, as of recording this video, we are on version 10.8.0. Correct. And that number is going to be different from the firmware that goes on the flight controller. So today we're going to be using Betaflight 4.3 on the flight controller, configuring using configurator 10.8.0. And we're just going to go ahead and plug it in. Uh, we've got the top plate taken off from the drone here, so we'll be pointing out how some things are hooked up when we get into it. And also note that we've got the props off. Off, because you don't want to get chopped up. There's a two plug up. rule. Two plug rule is if you have two plugs plugged into the flight controller and the power, which we don't at the moment, but if, if you have that going, you definitely don't want the props on. You should never have props on your drone if you're going to have two things plugged into your flight controller, the USB and the power, right? So if you're just doing a quick change and you're not gonna actually apply LiPo power, you could leave the props on, but some of the configurations that we're gonna do are going to require to have the ESCs powered up and in which case it could be very dangerous if you're making a change and something goes wrong, an incorrect signal could be sent causing the motors to spin up and if that happens on your bench, you could damage your computer or worse, your beautiful face. We don't wanna see your beautiful faces get torn up so please take the props off anytime you're doing anything in beta flight that requires you to have your battery plugged in. So we got our props off, we're being safety, let's get right into it. So when you plug it in, it'll immediately connect but Let's say you have a, an older flight controller that's got an earlier version of Betaflight. You're gonna need to flash it to the latest version. So where do you go? First place you're gonna go is to the top up here where it says update firmware. Mm -hmm. And I really like on this newer version of the configurator, they added an auto detect feature. Exactly. So previously you had to know what target you needed to put on your board and it didn't always line up with what the board says on the packaging, all that stuff. But now, you don't need to think about it. As long as the correct target is on there and it should be from the factory, just hit auto detect. Exactly. And boom, T-Motor F7, that is correct. And then you can pick your version. So we're just gonna pick the latest version, 4.3.0. Show unstable releases. That is if you're gonna get into some of the release candidates, some of the pre-release stuff. Uh, we usually don't recommend that, so you don't need to worry about that. Uh, the next option is for no reboot sequence. The no reboot sequence means you're telling Betaflight not to try to put the board in DFU mode, which is bootloader mode. So if you do that yourself, either by hitting the button on the flight controller or using a CLI command, you need to check that. But we're gonna go ahead and let Betaflight handle bootloader mode for us, so we're gonna leave it unchecked. 
What about full chip erase? Full chip erase is very important, especially moving to a brand new uh, version of Betaflight. Mm -hmm. If you're if you've got an older version on there, you just want to or guarantee that everything's getting erased. Right. So this is going to remove all pre-existing settings and make sure that you are starting from completely fresh canvas. Down. And what about that manual baud rate thing? Should they even touch that? No. Yeah. So whatever it's got there, um, unless you're using some sort of Bluetooth configurator or something, and the, the the device gives you instructions on changing that setting. Just leave it at whatever it is at by default is going to work. So, so we've got all our flashing settings taken care of. We've got our target selected. We've got our firmware version selected. What's next? Load firmware online. Right. So it's going to pull the correct firmware for the correct target from the Betaflight database in the cloud. So that does mean you need to be connected to the internet yes. for this part. So as long as you're on the internet, you click that, and boom, everything's loaded up. You've got your change log. Everything's good to go, and then you just flash the firmware. And we wait. Yep. It's going to first erase everything. Oh, no, wait, I need it. It's gone. It's, <laughs> it's too gone. late. It's, it's too late. Should I unplug it? Oh, no, don't unplug it. Once you've started it, do not unplug it. That's how you could you know, potentially break your flight controller. It's pretty hard to do, and even if you do, you should be able to save it with, uh, with a bootloader sequence, like I mentioned. But best practices when you're erasing or flashing, don't, just don't touch it. And we've successfully flashed. We got green. Green is good. Yes. All right, so now we'll go back up into Connect, and we'll go back into the configurator. First thing that's going to pop up is it's going to ask you if you want to apply the custom defaults. I always apply the custom defaults. If you hit cancel, there's a chance you can run into some issues where things aren't connecting correctly, motor mappings off, things like that. So always select. Yeah, so those are just settings that they know are going to be correct uh, as a baseline for that particular target that you selected. It's going to reboot everything, and it should automatically reconnect. But we still got warnings. Yes. So the warnings here, it's just letting you know that, hey, you've got no motor protocol selected. It's also saying uh, you have the accelerometer uh, enabled, but it's not calibrated. So for self-level mode, uh, angle yeah. mode, things like that. So these are just parts of the configuration that are critical to the operation of the drone. And it's noticing that we haven't selected anything. And that's totally fine. Because again, we're starting from scratch. We're going to take care of all these things. So just hit close, leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. So the first thing that I like to do is check the board orientation. So on this setup page, you've got a model of the drone represented on screen. And what's great is, as you tilt the actual drone, the model should move. Basically, if you grab the back of the drone and tilt it forward, you should see the back two motors go up. You should see correct sides go up. And you should also see the rotation of the drone on the screen match the physical drone. If it doesn't match, that's OK. You can fix that in the Configuration tab, just to jump ahead here. In these settings over here, for board and sensor alignment, you can put in different values to offset the board, right? So if, 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 say, you lifted the side of the drone and the model tipped forward, you would need to probably do like a 90 degree adjustment on the yaw. You'll have to play with it to get it right. You can make the change, save it, and go back to setup and just play with it till you get it right. But you shouldn't have to do that if you've aligned your board, right? So on this one, we've actually got it uh, aligned correctly, where the arrow printed on the flight controller is facing towards the nose of the drone. So if you've done that, you won't have this issue. But there are some times where you need to have the board uh, misaligned, depending on your build, where you want certain ports to be. And it's totally OK. It's totally OK to have your board not aligned correctly. You just need to make sure that you compensate for it in the configuration. That's the first thing you want to do. And yep. once you've done that, and smash that calibrate accelerometer exactly. button, right? Exactly. So hit that. Don't touch the table. And it's just going to calibrate your accelerometer, which is only going to be used if you use any auto level modes. If you fly only in rate modes, it doesn't matter. But I personally like to have uh, an auto level mode available on the switch, right? Yeah. And that's really all you're going to do on the tab that they call setup. You're not actually going to set up anything. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from here, then I usually go to the ports tab. And this tab is where you're going to set up all of the uh, things that you have connected to the flight controller. So these are the UART settings. So UART stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. Yes. Nailed it. <laughs> and you, think of those, you can think of the UARTs as like USB ports on your computer, where you can connect different accessories to your flight controller. So like I mentioned before, that could be a receiver, that could be a GPS, that could be your air unit. You need to tell the flight controller what you've connected to it and what language, what protocol it needs to use to communicate with those different items. So if you've done the build yourself, you should know what you connected to what. Uh, but if you don't, you could either look at what's printed on the board itself or look at a wiring diagram. Thankfully, on this T-Motor board, they actually have very clear labels, and we 
can see that the air unit cable is plugged into this rear port here that supplies uh, 10 volt power, ground, and has TX2, RX2, ground, and S bus. So if you look here, that's where you're gonna activate the MSP configuration here on UART2. Okay, so the MSP connection is essentially a connection like a USB. It gives you full access to the flight control. And you can actually see that for the USB UART, they've got uh, MSP checked, and don't ever uncheck that because then you won't be able to access your board through the USB port. But that MSP connection is going to allow the air unit to talk to the flight controller and actually change settings because with the uh, DJI system, you can change your PIDs exactly. uh, right in the goggle menu. And it's also going to be responsible for uh, taking the information and generating the, uh, the DJI-driven on-screen display. And if you happen to be using the, uh, the Avatar system, which is upcoming, you would also have it connected to MSP, even though you'd have to do some additional things to make the canvas mode on-screen display work. Uh, other times you might encounter an MSP connection would be like if you're soldering on a, a Bluetooth adapter to allow you to make changes uh, through your phone right. that uses MSP, and there could be some other things, but uh, most of you guys are probably using an air unit or an avatar, and you need to make sure that you get that MSP connected correctly. On that same port for the air unit, I mentioned there was something labeled S-Bus, um, and that would be another UART. Um, I think it's UART 1. Uh, five. It's UART 5, so that's good yes. to know. So you'd have to check the wiring diagram for that. So if we were going to use the air unit for control right. using the DJI radio, you would also need to turn on the receiver function for UART 5. But we're not doing that, right? Because we've got this Crossfire receiver. What's that hooked up to? Also UART 5. Okay, so there's two places where you can access UART 5 on this board, either through that plug for the DJI system or for the, through this Crossfire one. It's okay that they're soldered to the same one? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's cool. I didn't know that, so it'll just listen to whatever language we tell it to listen to. Right. Okay, so we've got the Crossfire receiver hooked up to uh, R5 and T5, so I guess we're still gonna just click Serial RX. Right. It's very important to get the right function clicked for the right UART. So if we had this Crossfire receiver over here on UART 4, you would click four instead. What you need to know is that every horizontal line represents that UART and you can only assign one function. You couldn't just also solder up a GPS to UART 5 and tell it to do that. You'd need to do a separate one. But you know, like if we did hook up a GPS to UART 3, that would be over there in like peripherals, right? Uh, yes, I believe our, that would be in sensors. Oh, sensor, over, yeah. But we didn't do that. Right. We're not messing with GPS no. today. All we're doing is the UART, all we're doing is the MSP connection on UART 2 and the receiver connection on UART 5. Yep, and then from there, you just save and reboot. We still got warnings. It's still not happy with us. Yes. Okay, we're gonna get to the motor stuff, beta flight. Calm down. And verified. Uh, for some reason, it likes to default back to the ports tab. Um, even though it says setup up here. But yeah, I just verify that the ports are correct and then we can move on to the configuration tab. So this is where we change those settings that you may have heard of where it's 8K, 4K, 8K, 8K and all that stuff. What all that means is you're setting the speed of the processor and the speed of the communication to the ESCs, right? So that's the gyro update frequency and the PID loop frequency. Uh, we're just gonna leave those alone. This is using the Bosch gyro, mm -hmm. so, uh, and Past flight controllers, you usually see 8K up here, 8K, 8K, or 8K, 4K. Right. This newer Bosch gyro is uh, 3.2K. So there are different gyros that could be put on the flight controller from the manufacturer. Especially today with the chip shortage that we're facing, manufacturers are uh, having to start using different gyros. It seems that the most common one right now is a Bosch style gyro that actually runs on like a base 3.2. So if you were using an MPU 6000 or an ICM 2060, whatever it is, those would run on like a 4K or an 8K update frequency. Um, and you could have some room to play with that, whether you want to use 4 or 8. But if you see that it's set to 3.2, that means you're probably running the Bosch gyro and you just shouldn't touch it, right? Yes, just leave it alone. So right here we have the different sensors on the flight controller. We have the accelerometer, which is the uh, the piece that we calibrated on the setup page. Mm -hmm. We will be using that for uh, auto level mode, so I'm gonna leave that on. But the barometer and magnetometer, we don't even have on this flight controller, so we could save some resources by turning those off. Uh, moving down on the left side here, you have the craft name, so if you 
have a certain name you want for your build, you can just slap that right in here. This is a beautiful Skyliner, so. So yes, and a cool thing that Betaflight does for you is as you name your crafts, it kind of saves them. Oh, cool. So this is a Skyliner. Below that, there's a setting for your camera angle. What that does is there are flight modes where the flight controller could compensate for the angle of your camera and do some of the yaw and roll mixing for you. It's cute, but I don't recommend using it, so I would just leave it at zero, even though you will be angling your camera. If that's something you want to play with, you can check out some other videos on that, but our personal recommendation is do the mixing of roll and yaw yourself with your thumbs and just leave that set to zero. Yes. What about the arming angle? What's that? That is very important. So. Um by default, it's set so that the quad pretty much has to be basically flat on the ground like this to arm. Right, at 25 degrees, if the quad is tilted more than that, it won't let you spin up the props. Correct. So that could be a problem. Yes, so what we like to do is set it at 180 degrees, so pretty much any angle, like upside down even, you can arm the, arm the motors. Yeah, so if you're ever gonna take off from a hill, or from a launch gate, or if you're crashed upside down or in a tree and you're trying to arm it to hear it or to shake it loose, you need to have that set. It is technically, like a safety feature, right. right? If you leave it set to 25, it could be thought of as being more safe, but it would require that you're always taking off from a flat surface, which isn't the case. So, so go ahead and set it to 180, but just be careful when you're arming your drone, which you should do always anyways. Uh, moving down, we have uh, other features here. The only two that are set by default that I even mess with are air mode and OSD. Something I like to do that not too many other people do is I turn off air mode in other features. And Having it checked by default means that air mode is permanently enabled on the flight controller and what air mode is in Betaflight, it's a different term. It's, it's a, air mode is a term that's used in different firmwares like KISS and all that stuff differently, but in Betaflight what it means is that it boosts the effect of the PID controller at low throttle, so it gives you more stability when you're doing low throttle maneuvers. That's what air mode is in Betaflight. I like to not have it turned on full time. If you uncheck it in the configuration tab, it will show up later in the modes tab and it will be something that you can turn on and off with a switch on your radio. I like to do that so I can turn off air mode if I'm doing like grinds or slides or other contact tricks with my drone, but most people just leave it checked. So we'll just go ahead and leave it checked today. Down below that you also have GPS. We're not using a GPS, mm -hmm. so we're gonna leave that disabled. The only other thing that I set up is going to be the D-Shot beacon configuration, and that's the beeping uh, sound that the motors make. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So we used to always have to solder a separate buzzer to the flight controller if we wanted the drone to be able to beep to help us find it if we crashed, something like that. But now they can actually use the motors as a beeper, which is yes. great, so we can turn that on. So there's two options here. There's RX set, which is, um, set up so that you can uh, have a switch set up to activate the motors as a buzzer. Mm -hmm. And then there's RX loss, which means if the transmitter that you're using is not connected right, to the so receiver. Right, say if you turn right. off your radio, It'll it just automatically beep. beeps. I hate leaving this on because right. if you plug in the drone and your radio is not connected, you just have to listen to the beeping like crazy. Yeah, It's a good idea to have it turned on because if you fail safe, which means you've uh, lost connection to your drone when you shouldn't, the beeper will turn on by default. But I agree, 99% of the time is just an annoyance. So. Yes, and I, have, I do have to plug in drones all day, every day, so yeah. hearing the sound is, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty annoying. Once you've done that, though, you're just gonna come down here, hit save and reboot. It's gonna exit out, and it should automatically connect. Still upset with us. I've still got a few flight. warnings. We're gonna get to the motor stuff. We're gonna get to the motor stuff. We're gonna get there. So next up, do we need to do anything in that power and battery tab? You should not need to do anything in this tab. Mm -hmm. um, the defaults are fine. What that tab is for is to calibrate the detected battery voltage. So if you find that you're plugging in a battery that's charged to 16.8 volts and your on-screen display is only showing you 14 volts or something, you can compensate for that there. But you shouldn't have that problem. If you flash the correct target and apply the custom defaults and all that stuff, it should be good to go. Right. If you are having that problem, it most likely indicates that you've got a different issue. So you shouldn't have to touch this stuff. Moving forward, there's the pre uh, presets tab. And uh, this has made things very easy on the setup and PID tuning side okay. of uh, Betaflight. It lets you uh, use PIDs and filters that other people have already figured out for the same build or similar builds. You can just click on that and set it up. Eventually, we'll put all the presets for our different drones in there. So you'll be able to pre-select it. 
uh, but for now we'll set it all up manually. So you'll see that the next tab down is the PID tuning tab where you can set all the uh, PIDs and filters yourself. But we're gonna skip over that for now because there are some settings that we need to uh, turn on to activate other features in the PID tuning tab. So we're just gonna jump straight down to receiver. Receiver tab. This is where you're going to set up everything for the crossfire receiver that we have on this build. You're going to tell the flight controller how to talk to the receiver, and all that depends on which receiver you're using, right? You could be using the air unit's built-in receiver. You could be using a free sky receiver, a ghost, whatever. In this case, we've got a crossfire receiver. For these settings to work, you need to make sure the UART setting is correct for the receiver. We already did that, so the flight controller knows to talk to a receiver using UART 5, uh, but now we need to tell it what language to use, right? Yes, and to do that, you're gonna go to this receiver tab right here, and you're going to select serial via UART. Okay. And for the, rece the receiver type, we're gonna select crossfire, CRSF. Okay, so now the flight controller is going to uh, know to talk to the receiver over a UART and know to use Crossfire protocol to talk to that receiver. So now's a good time to hit save and reboot. All right, we still don't have the motor set up, we know. So now that we've done that, the screen has changed a little bit. We've got access to more channels, we can change the channel map, things like that. And really now we're at the point where we gotta plug in the battery for the first time yes. so that we can actually power up the receiver. Some fly controllers will actually power the receiver through the USB, but more common than not, you'll need to plug in the actual battery. So you can see we got a flashing green light on the crossfire. Uh, we gotta bind it to this transmitter. Binding is getting the receiver and the transmitter linked up. And the binding process is going to vary a little bit depending on uh, what receiver you're using. But for the most part, it's pretty similar. Uh, you activate binding in the radio, you hit a button on the receiver. Um, on some receivers, actually what's nice about this crossfire, since it's never been bound to anything before, it went straight into binding mode, so we don't even have to hit the button. So blinking green light means it's trying to bind. A green light on the receiver means we are bound, and if we look on screen, we can see the drone is freaking out! Mm -hmm. It's because of the channel mapping is incorrect. So even though the we aren't inputting the sticks, it sees an input on the roll axis. If you move the throttle, it's affecting the roll. So we need to find a different order of the channel. So by default, it's on AETR, which puts the order of channels, it, aileron, elevator, throttle, roll, but that's not what we've got on this setup. We gotta find the correct channel map. Yes, it's going to be the spectrum one here, which is T-A-E-R, um, hit save. And now it stopped moving and you can verify that everything is correct, what you should do. What, what you wanna see is when you move the throttle up, the throttle bar goes up, down goes down. With the roll stick, move that to the left. You should see the bar go to the left. Same with the yaw. Move the yaw to the left. You see the bar go left and right. And with pitch, when you move the pitch stick down, it should go to the left and up should be to the right. So all of that looks correct. One thing I think is worth mentioning is uh, just back on the channel map. If for whatever reason, these three presets that they have here don't work for you, you can still manually go in and actually type in, uh, in any order, R, E, A, T, or you know, however you'd want uh, for your mapping to be. Um, do it. And just hit save. So yeah, one, two, three, four. And yeah, completely change it up to however you want if your radio or setup is just odd. Oh, that's really nice to know that if you have some weird settings in the radio that instead of having to navigate the nightmare of open TX on a yes. roller, you can just do it in beta flight. Exactly. Thankfully, there aren't any weird settings going on here, so we can just click that preset. Another thing to look out for is do you have any jitter? So when you're not touching the sticks, how much are those numbers moving? Looks like just one here for this radio. Yeah, so if you have a little bit of jitter, you can calibrate your radio to get rid of that, but it may never go away depending on what radio you're using. There may always be that little bit of, of jitter. It's really not too bad on this. It's just like going between like zero and one. So if you do have that, something you can do to compensate for it is RC deadband, right? And just add that in for the value that it's changing. Yeah, I think in general putting in, so you've put in one, which would compensate for what we're seeing. Uh, in general, I think putting like three or even five is a good catch-all. 
Right. You know, you could be out there flying and like the temperature of the air could kind of affect the sensitivity of the gimbals, or maybe get like a little grit in there or something. So three or five is fine. Another thing I like to do is the stick low threshold. So what that does is it won't let you arm the drone unless your throttle stick is below a certain point. What that does is tells the flight controller uh, how low would you ever expect the throttle to be and below what point does the throttle need to be uh, to arm it. So, so by default, unless your throttle input is below a value of 1050, uh, the drone won't arm. The problem is this has a side effect of creating a throttle dead band. So everything below 1050, the drone doesn't actually respond to. You get a little bit of dead band at the bottom. Um, you may not even notice it, but if you're doing a lot of low throttle maneuvers, I think it's pretty annoying. So I, I can feel it. I think it's pretty annoying. So I like to drop this all the way down to just 1,000. Five. The only thing to keep in mind is your drone will not arm unless the throttle is actually that low. So make sure that when you move the throttle stick to the bottom, it's actually below 1,005. And when I arm my drone, sometimes I need to like actively hold the throttle down to be able to arm it. But it just makes throttle a lot smoother at, with low throttle maneuvers. RC smoothing, do you mess with that at all? I leave it on defaults. So that's a function where the flight controller actually smooths your inputs a little bit. It's not gonna compensate for everything. You still have to be smooth on the sticks, but it does help just you know keep the quad from overreacting. The default settings are fine. And typically, uh, if not the defaults, I'm using a preset based on the receiver that I'm using. That will uh, change these for you. Last thing to do is just hit save. So now that we've got everything set up in the receiver tab, the flight controller knows how to respond to our stick inputs, but it doesn't know how to respond to our switch inputs. Uh, we would set that up in the following tab, which is modes, but we're gonna skip over that again because we still gotta get that motor protocol set up to enable uh, one of the modes we're gonna use. So we're gonna skip right over and finally we're gonna get to the motors tab. Yes, the motors tab. So this is where we're gonna configure the um, the order of our motors and the direction of the motors and also what protocol we're gonna be using. Right, so even up top quad X, um, most every, like every drone we sell is a X quad, but you'll see like there are some other options. Like if you were doing like, like a, like a tricopter or something like that, or a bicopter, that's all in there, but more than likely you're gonna be using a X quad. So first thing we're gonna need to do is um, since our moto protocol is disabled is we need to uh, enable that. So this is essentially defining the language with which the flight controller talks to the ESCs. Um, so there's different options here. There's like pulse width modulation, which is a slow, outdated uh, language. There's brushed, if you're actually hooking up brush motors where the, if, where the flight controller would be set up with, with uh, FATS to actually drive a brush motor. But we've got BL Heli 32, yes. brushless motors, the latest, the greatest. So we're gonna pick a D-Shot protocol, right? Yes, and I'm choosing D-Shot 300. But why uh, not go fast? Why not go 600? Uh, with this newer uh, Bosch Gyro, there's some weird stuff. Uh -huh. I can't really explain it, but I've found that using D-Shot 300, the 3.2K gyro and PID loop frequency, right. um, um, that D-Shot 300 just seems to work the best. Gives you the most reliable performance. Yes. Uh, personally, I always use D-Shot 300, even when I was using some of the other gyros that let me crank up the uh, processing speed to like 8K. Um, I just always thought D-Shot 300 was a little bit more reliable. You may see some other people that are trying to squeeze every last bit of performance, set their drone to run on 8K, 8K, use D-Shot 600. We've even seen uh, other versions of the firmware that let you go up to D-Shot 1200, but 300 is gonna be fine, it's gonna be reliable. That's what we're using here. Yes. Uh, moving down, you have motor stop, uh, which is don't spin the motors when armed. I never have used this before. I believe uh, when you arm, uh, it doesn't do anything until you actually add throttle. Yeah, that's right. So with motor stop enabled, even when you arm the quad, the, mo the props won't start spinning until you give it throttle. This is a really bad idea because if you were trying to do a split S and get some like inverted hang time, you lower the throttle all the way down, the motors will stop and you will lose control of your drone. So don't, don't turn motor stop on. Uh, yes. And uh, also ESC sensor is another one that I've never used before. It's yeah, so ESC sensor is if you're going to use ESC telemetry. That just enables uh, an additional communication between the 
ESC and the flight controllers. But really, you don't need to use that because D-Shot can handle two-way communication and is going to be able to get all the information back and forth that you need for uh, the features that we're going to use. So you don't need to use ESC sensor, but you do need to use the next one. Which is the bi-directional D-Shot. And uh, when you enable that, you actually see here that, hey, you're going to have some filter changes happening, that uh -huh. your dynamic notch values are about to change. Right. Um, so that's going to enable some of those things that we were mentioning in the, uh, the PIDs tab and the modes tab, because we've now given the flight controller the ability to not just talk to the ESC, but also listen to the ESC. So it's going to do things like let us use the motor beeper that we mentioned. It's going to let the flight controller reverse the direction of the motor for like turtle mode. And it's also going to enable a uh, RPM based notch filter. So we'll get to that in a little bit, right? So you're just going to hit agree. When you uh, enable the bi-directional D-Shot, it's going to ask you uh, how many motor poles do your motors have. And to find that out, uh, you're going to count the magnets that are on the inside of the bell here. And on almost all of our motors, the default value is correct. There, you're going to find that there are 14 magnets. If you're flying our Hype Train, Freestyle, Acro, Drib, Vortex, Vanover, Let's Fly, even, even some of the smaller Tiny Whoop motors, even some of the smaller Cine Whoop motors, they're all... 14 pole motors, but right. it never hurts to double check. Just flip the motor over, count the magnets, and put the number of magnets there for number of poles. And then uh, below that, you've got your motor idle, um, and that's the uh, static percent. So 5.5 is the default, mm -hmm. and yeah, that's uh, the percentage at which your motor's idle. Right, so again, if you're trying to do like really long hang times, you could play with that, try lowering your idle so that you have kind of less thrust when your motors are spinning at their minimum speed. Uh, however, the lower you go, the harder it is for the drone to stay stable, and you could also end up with one of the motors stalling and, and spinning out. So 5.5 is a safe value. So now that we've done all of that, uh, we're going to want to go and hit save and reboot. Yeah. We're still plugged in. Yeah, so we've still got the drone plugged in, and that's because now that we've got the a flight controller talking to the ESC, which you can tell because we finally are hearing some beeps go down. Yep. Um, there's some more settings we can do where we can set up the order of the motors and the direction of the motors. This is the absolute greatest thing about this newest version of Betaflight. So before, if you found that when you try to spin up motor one, another motor spun up and you know all the motors were basically out of order, the drone would absolutely not be able to fly. You need to either reorder the motors by reorienting the ESC or by going into the CLI command and doing a bunch of complicated stuff. But it's so great in this newest version that you can reorder the motors with a wizard and same thing with motor direction. You need the props to be spinning the right direction as indicated by the diagram, and you can do that all right here. It's super easy, I love it. It's great. So yeah, first thing I do is start off with reordering the motors. You're gonna click here, and it's- So you get this warning. It's telling you to have your props off. We talked about this, your props better be off. This is like absolutely when you better have your props off, because we are about to intentionally spin up the motors while it's sitting right here in front of us. Yes, so we understand the risk and the propellers are removed. I'm gonna check that box and we're gonna hit start. So now it started spinning one of the motors and it's got a diagram where to ask me which motor is spinning. So I've got the drone sitting here in front of me with the tail facing me so that it matches up with the diagram and the motor that's spinning is the front right. So you just click on that. Now another motor starts spinning. That's the front left. Move around. Now we've got the back right. Yep. And the back left motor. Okay. All right, and once you've clicked all four motors, you can hit save. save. And just like that, your motors are reordered. Never been easier. You people just getting into this, you don't know how good that is. You don't know what we used to have to do. Oh, same thing with motor direction, right? So to change motor direction before, you used to have a whole separate program to go into the BL Heli settings, which by the way, isn't necessarily a bad idea if you want to get more advanced. There are some uh, other settings in the ESCs that you can change to squeeze out a little bit more performance, um, but it's not necessary. And now that you can just do motor directions right here in Betaflight, we're not gonna bother with that today. So let's go again and start up the other wizard. Motor direction, again, better have them props off. Yep. Can't say it enough. All right, we understand the risk. So select that. That gives you an option um, where you can use the wizard, which is the what I always do, but uh -huh. you could also have them spin up individually and you know change that way. So we're gonna use the wizard, yes. 
And so now it's just spinning all the motors and it's giving us a diagram showing which direction they should all be spinning. So I'm just gonna touch each motor to feel which way it's spinning. And if you've soldered all your motor wires kind of straight in the same order to each ESC output, you'll probably find that all four motors are spinning in the same direction. And that is indeed the case here. All these motors are spinning counterclockwise. And you see on the diagram, we do want motors two and three spinning counterclockwise, but motors one and four, we want spinning clockwise. So at the bottom here, I guess we just click one. Click one, you'll it see it stops change. Spinning. It start, so it stops and changes direction. So you select the motors that you need to switch, and now I'll just double check it. They're all spinning the same direction. So basically the front motors, two and four, are spinning inward toward the nose of the drone, and the back motors, one and three, are spinning inward towards the tail of the drone. Uh, that's how we set up all our five-inch freestyle drones, which is the default motor direction. Uh, we do have our ducted drones spin with props out, so all the directions are essentially reversed. We just find on the ducted, it kind of helps a little bit, but just, yeah. it's personal preference. You could do outward spinning props on five-inch, some pilots like that. You could do inward spinning props on cine whoops. It's, it's a personal preference thing. Uh, so yeah, we've just closed out of that. But one thing I like to do just as a sanity check is uh, come over here to the right side of the screen mm -hmm. and uh, manually spin up each of the motors just to make sure that motor one is where it, you know, it says it's supposed to be over here yeah. uh, and that it is spinning the right direction. So I'll just click on motor one and I'm gonna use the uh, keypad here to, to spin that motor up. Okay. And yeah, I can see that the back right motor is spinning as it should be. The other reason why it's a good idea to double check things uh, by spinning up the motors manually is you can check that the R and the E numbers are changing. So when you're spinning up the motors, you should see the actual RPM indicated by the R value, and you should see that the E value is very low, basically be zero. If you have anything in the E, which is the error, it means you probably have set up the number of motor poles wrong, or there's some other problem with the uh, communication between your flight controller and the ESC and, and reading the RPM, which means that that RPM filter that we mentioned that we're gonna set up a little bit later will not work at all. So you, you wanna make sure that when you spin up these motors, you see zero errors. And it doesn't hurt to you know spin them up and Woo! actually- Woo! So <laughs> <laughs> Make sure uh, you're not hearing anything weird. Nah, right. Yeah, you don't want to hear any crunching no noises, things like that. But yeah, I'll spin up uh, each of the motors in order. So we've got one, two, three, and four. Everything looks All good. of them are spinning, all of them spun up in the correct order. All of them are spinning in the right direction. We've got zero error. Things are looking great. Great. So from there, stop the motors. So now with all the motor settings on, we can return to the PID settings because we'll have access to that RPM filter we mentioned. We can actually unplug the battery at this point. In the setup process, um, you're not gonna really need to mess with much here because the defaults from Betaflight um, are kind of based around your standard five inch drone. Okay, so if you're flying a drone with five inch propellers, you don't need to change anything. The drone is going to fly. In fact, we recommend that you do fly it on defaults. Don't use one of the presets right out of the gate. Don't try to pid tune it right out of the gate. Uh, just try and fly it and make sure everything works, and then from there you can dial it in. So the, the pid controller is the control loop for correcting the drone's error. An error comes from if the drone is uh, knocked from an external force like wind, or if you give a stick command. So essentially what happens is the drone will be at, say, this angle, and either it gets bumped by the wind, and now it needs to correct back to that angle. Or you give it a stick input and it says, oh, I'm supposed to be over here and I'm over here, so I need to correct for that. So correcting for that error is done by the PID controller. And the different terms, the P and the I and the D, control how that correction is made. Essentially, the proportional is how strongly does the drone react to error. The integral is how sensitive is it to external forces like wind or the uh, center of gravity being off. And the derivative can be thought of as like a dampening effect, right? So yeah, when it, when it corrects for some error, the P will put it over here and if it overshoots, then it'll oscillate and then you kind of get that like The D is kind of like a dampener where 
it won't overshoot. It'll just go right to where it needs to be. Uh, to change those settings, it's really nice. This newer version of Betaflight has different sliders for the tracking, which is the P and the I that I mentioned, the dampening, which is the D gain, and then stick response, which is a new F term, which tries to provide a little bit of separation for how the drone responds to error induced from external forces like wind and error induced from your stick inputs, right? So you can have essentially a different reaction for intentional error that you've input and external error. Yes, and uh, there's another thing too with expert mode that when enabled unlocks a lot more sliders. Do you mess with those? I personally just do the first threes. And if I find that the drone isn't responsive enough, I will just increase this slider. If I have some of that like doo -doo 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 kind of thing I was talking about, I dampen that out. Um, if I want the stick to be more responsive without uh, messing up other aspects of the tune, I'd play um, with the feed forward, but honestly, I end up pretty dang close to defaults. Pretty much default for me, but you go a little bit more in depth. You hit the advanced sliders. What all do you do? Uh, typically, I will automatically take the D max dampening slider all the way down because there, I don't think that your D should have a um, dynamic change happening. You'll see that, that they've got derivative and D max, and what Betaflight is doing is it's varying D depending on how much it thinks you need. I, I do like using the dynamic D gain, but you don't. You just turn it all the way down. Yeah, it just makes things a little bit simpler for me. I'm not okay. worrying about things changing on the D gain. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, though, I, I throw that all the way down, and um, I mostly mess with the master multiplier mm -hmm. because the relationship between uh, D gain and P gain stock at 1.0, for the most part, on most of our builds, is yeah. pretty great. It's, and I'll just you know bump it up and down on the master slider for the most part. Other than that, there's also this drift wobble slider that comes in handy a lot. Mm -hmm. um, as you're flying smooth forward flight, if you're noticing weird bobbles, things like wobbles, uh, you can just slide that down or up. But uh, generally, you want to, this number here, or the you want this slider to be as high as possible without any issues. So then, in addition to the sliders that control the uh, PID values themselves, we've also got some other PID controller settings. You can adjust some of the more specific functions of feed forward. I never touch that. I leave yeah. it factory. And I wouldn't touch these either, mm -hmm. unless you're digging into black box recordings, things like that. I would leave your feed forward settings up to presets. Uh -huh. To change those, um, that would be based on the receiver that you're using. Oh, okay. So if you're using Crossfire, that's when I would go into the Presets tab. Yeah, would, so if you wanted to get specific about different receivers, you can find different feed forward settings that uh, kind of take into account how fast your receiver talks to the flight controller. Uh, you've also got iTerm Relax, which tries to uh, keep your iTerm from overshooting. So I will mess with the iTerm Relax, and it has to do with something called iTerm Windup, okay. which a good way of knowing what that is, is say you're doing a fast, full 360 degree flip, and uh, you get like this big bounce back from that. Right, that which way. isn't a P bounce back. A P bounce back is usually more like boo doo doo. Right. An I term bounce back is more of like a... Exactly. Right. So um, messing with the cutoff number here, uh, by bringing that down, if I get that I term wind up, okay. will help, will help that. There's also anti-gravity, that actually boosts your I term with fast throttle movement. So yes. uh, what you might find is that when you uh, rapidly move your throttle, the nose of your drone might bounce a bit. So you can either increase the eye term in general, which might cause other problems like wind up or a stiff feeling. So if you have that bouncing, you can increase your eye term values, but that might create like an overly stiff feeling or create that wind up issue we were just talking about. So a way you can address just that nose bouncing without uh, creating other eye problems is to adjust the anti-gravity settings. Again, I think the defaults are pretty good. Usually. I, yeah. I, most of our builds I end up bumping up to around five or six. Okay. Uh, bigger seven inch builds or builds that don't have as much power to weight ratio, uh, those might be 10. But oh, wow. yeah, so you can, you can play with a lot. Uh, what I've noticed too is with anti-gravity, if you go too high, the problem actually comes back. Oh, okay. So there's a sweet spot. It's a bell curve. Yes. Eye term rotation, do you ever touch that? Never touch eye term rotation. It's oh. mostly for line of sight pilots. Uh, that's just something that helps the eye term do some stuff if you're doing like a lot of constant yawing. That's not something you do with FPV. Don't worry about that. 
And what about dynamic dampening? Now you turn that off, right? Yes, and by doing bringing the dynamic dampening all the way down does that for you. Right, so those settings won't even do anything on yours. I leave the dynamic dampening um, slider on default, and I also leave those settings on default. So Moving down, um, the throttle boost, that is another one that I never mess with. Um, okay. I mean, unless you're digging into black box logs, things like that, I would just leave it at default. Mm -hmm. But uh, below that, the motor output limit, um, this one can be very useful if, um, say, you want to tame your motors out a little bit. Okay. Um, you can just bring this number down. So at 100, your motor's at 100% uh, power, mm -hmm. and, it, and you can drop them down from there. Say the high KV is just a little bit too much, you could bring it to 95, 90%. Uh, That's nice. You put on some like kind of training wheels, right? Yes. Also, if you're using high KV on a 6S motor, Oh, so that's how you handle it if you, okay, so if you plug in a 6S motor on to say drip motors, which are 2650 kV, that's way too high for 6S. Correct. So you can limit the output so that you get effectively a lower kV. And there's things you can do right below this here with the uh, cell count for auto profile switching. So that's really cool because the flight controller can read the voltage of the battery and determine is it a 4S or a 6S and it can switch PID settings based on that voltage including your throttle limit. So we set up all the drones that we build here with that stuff set up so that if you buy a 4S drone and plug in a 6S battery, you're not gonna fry your motors. Right. That's a little bit more advanced. We're not really gonna get into that right now. So let's, I guess, move on over to rates. Onto the rates tab, yes. Rate profile settings. So this is all personal preference. Again, stock rates are totally fine. The rates define how the drone responds to stick commands. So you can see that graph right there. Along the x-axis is your stick input, and along the y-axis is the response of the drone. So if you had it linear, moving your throttle halfway from the middle position to the fully deflected position would essentially give you half of the maximum amount of rotation that the drone would ever be set up to do. But you can see it's not linear. We've got kind of an exponential curve. Well, so at center stick, you don't necessarily want it to be linear. Uh, mm -hmm. well, not everyone, I guess. It's, like you said, personal preference. But um, at center stick, typically you'd like it to be a little bit mushier and smoother. Right, so if you're just making little corrections, the drone isn't overshooting. Exactly, and you're not jittery and things like that when you're trying to fly smooth. Right, but if you do move the stick all the way to the end because you're trying to do a snappy Rubik's Cube, it can ramp up and give you a higher total rotation. So yeah, there's different settings and there's also different types of rate. There's actual, there's beta flight style, and that's all gonna be personal preference and the only way you can figure it out is to uh, play with different rates and see what feels good to you. One thing I would encourage you to do is don't go too high with your rates. You know, you see some pilots uh, ramp their rates way up because it seems really cool to be able to like spin the drone really fast, but it makes it harder to do more controlled movements. So I'd say start on low rates. A lot of um, really talented pilots fly very low rates. I mean, Vanover, he can only flip the drone like this fast. I mean, he, he does not right. do any real snappy stuff. It's all personal preference. Just play with uh, what you wanna do. I also do something really weird. I make my yaw more linear because I had a little experience with uh, collective pitch helicopters and it was kind of common to have a very linear response on yaw. So I, I make my yaw more of a straight line because you don't use a whole lot of yaw with FPV anyway. You don't have to get into all that. The defaults are fine, right? What do you fly? Uh, I fly close to Vanover rates. Okay. So I typically come down. Uh, and I've noticed too with actual rates, it's made things a little bit easier to understand, mm -hmm. um, which is nice that they're default. So you've got your center sensitivity here. Um, if you want, want it more uh, sensitive, you can bump it up. If you want it a little bit more mushy, you can bring that number down. Right. And it's just a little bit simpler to explain. But uh, then you can set that maximum rate separately, right? So you can just exactly. basically say using the max rate input, how fast do you ever want the drone to spin? And then in the center sensitivity setting, how do you want it to feel when you're doing smaller inputs? Exactly. Just make those two adjustments and leave it alone. Okay. If you wanted some extra expo added on, you could do that as well. That's an additional center sensitivity. I don't even know why when you're using actual rates you need to have both of them, but it's a way to make quick adjustments, I guess. Other than that, you have the TPA and TPA breakpoint. I would leave those at stock settings. TPA stands for Throttle PID Attenuation, 
And what that does is the more throttle you give it uh, past a certain point set by the brake point, it starts to reduce your PID values. And, and doing that prevents the drone from getting overreactive when you're uh, giving it a lot of power. Usually the default settings are fine. I never mess with the default settings, really, unless it's a, a different craft that's not your standard five inch build. Um, yeah. For the most part though, the stock settings are completely fine. But once you've got your settings, everything's saved or dialed in, you would just come down here, hit save, and move on to the filters settings. The filters are what clean up the motor noise and just the noises that are coming from your craft. So the flight controller can detect every little bit of movement going on with your drone, whether that's it's actually rotating or that the motors are spinning and vibrating the frame, the flight controller will see that. And the filters help the flight controller be prevented from perceiving that vibration as movement and reacting to it. So mm -hmm. you've got uh, low pass filters, which allow everything lower than a set frequency to pass through. And you can think about that would work very well for motor vibrations because they're spinning very fast. It's gonna be some sort of very high frequency vibration. You want the flight controller to ignore that and you only want it to be detecting what are gonna be relatively low frequency movements. I mean, even if you're rotating the drone at 660 degrees per second, that's still a much lower frequency movement than a prop spinning at thousands of RPM. So again, with this newer version of Betaflight, you've got sliders for the filters. You can keep the setup very simple. If you think that the drone is overreacting to vibrations, which, I mean, how would you usually see that show up? Uh, either in black box recordings or just in your actual FPV feed. Okay. So you're seeing vibrations, you can well, also hear it, right? Hearing, that's the other thing too. Um, if you've got your quad, you know, just an arm and you're hearing weird crunchy or grinding motors, right. that's a sign that your filters or some other settings might be off. Yeah, so if you're just trying to hover it and you see the drone like mm, jiggling and going crazy, um, it could be something with your PIDs, but if those are stock, it also might be something with your filters. So you could just very simply uh, grab this slider and move it to more filtering. Um, if you want the drone to be as responsive as possible, you actually want to slide the filters towards less filtering. It's going to make the drone uh, react quicker. Uh, the problem is more noise is going to get through. So pilots that are trying to tune their drone for the kind of highest level of responsiveness will basically move that slider as low as possible without inducing some of those weird vibrations. Personally, I go a little more filtering yeah. because I want to be able to uh, not have to worry about is it more humid today and the air is thicker, uh, did I clip a, a branch and now my prop is slightly out of balance. I want a little more filtering to give me a, a larger tolerance for the condition of drone, the conditions of weather and the conditions of the drone that I can fly it. Typically for someone who's not experienced with tuning filters, I would suggest that if you're going to move the sliders in any direction to move both the gyro filter multiplier and the E-term filter multiplier together. So as, so as you change those sliders, you'll see the numbers in the low pass filters fields changing. Um, I think using the filters is fine. Uh, both for the PIDs and the filters, if you want to get advanced, you could uh, go in there and type in numbers manually, but usually the sliders are pretty good. And typically the default settings on the sliders, or for this 1.0 on the sliders is great for yeah. most of our five inch builds. Moving down to the notch filters. The other thing that you want to check is this RPM filter setting. Uh, do you change any of the settings in the, the RPM filter? Typically no. Okay. Uh, the stock settings are great for our standard builds. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to mess with them usually. Um, I just want to verify that they are active though here and that everything's checked and turned on. One thing when the gyro RPM filter is turned on, um, if it's doing its job correctly the way that it's supposed to, um, you really don't need this gyro low pass filter anymore. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So when I have RPM filter set up and everything's working correctly, typically what I'll do is just turn this off right here. So you leave the second one on though? Correct. I'll leave the, the low pass two on, but I don't need the dynamic. Uh, filter changing, so gotcha. you can remove that completely on a clean build. I mean, I usually leave it on, but yeah. you know, again, he's trying to squeeze out all the performance, make the drones fly ultra fuego. Try it out, see what happens. You know, if your motors get a little hot, toasty, you know, turn it back on. Exactly. Again, again, another way to think about if you need more or less filtering, like we talked about, how it might sound, and also feel the motors. Again, once you've stopped the props, the, it's normal for the motors to be warm, even borderline borderline hot, but like if they're like too hot, like if you grab it, you're like, ooh, ah, that's too hot. 
You probably need to uh, increase your filtering or maybe your PIDs are way off. So warm motors are fine, but if they're getting really scorched and hot, you're going to want to fix your, uh, your configuration before you start burning them up and rooting them. Exactly. Because if you nick a prop at that point or if anything you've happens, got no tolerance, you've right? got no tolerance. Exactly. You're going to end up smoking something. The thing about PID tuning and filter settings is there's so much that can be done with it. It really is a whole video topic in itself. We have made videos about PIDs and filters before, so you could check out some of those. But really, you can get away with using default or close to default, and you're just going to have to play and experiment. But if you're flying one of our drones, they've come pre-tuned by the master himself. Or uh, if you've built one of our drones, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have screenshots available or, or hit up our support email and we can, we can send you some settings to use. We've got all our PIDs, we've got our rates, we've got our filter set, we can hit save and we can move on. We've already done the receiver and we can go into modes now. Yes, we can go into modes. Back into the modes tab, it's gonna be a lot easier to set this up if the receiver is powered. Uh, some flight controllers will actually power the receiver uh, from the USB, uh, but a lot of times that's not the case, and that's not the case with this one, so we need to uh, plug in our battery again. And so we've got our green light back on on our receiver, which means our crossfire is talking, so now it's gonna make assigning the switches a lot easier. So it's really convenient if you handle the binding and get everything set up before you do the modes, because this is where you assign different switches to do different functions on the flight controller, and if you've got it linked up, you can actually you can actually yes. do it by moving the, the actual switch, right? Exactly. You don't have to manually do things. You can let it, uh, the radio do it for you. So um, arm, that's the most important uh, switch that you need assigned. All you're going to do is hit add range. Uh, right here in the drop down, it's set to auto. So uh, let's see what switch do we want to use. What do we use? We this use this is, one up here? Yeah, this Boom. is arm switch. You can see when you move this switch, it set it to aux one, and so now when you move this switch, you guys see that tick mark moving. So basically, I'll just put the switch in the position that I want the drone to be armed in, there, and then you move that bar to be uh, at a range where the tick mark is. So now when I flip the switch to the other position, the tick mark moves outside of that bar, meaning the drone is disarmed, and when I put it there, it will be armed. Other switches that we set up, angle mode. So same thing, you're just gonna add range. The switch that we use. Put that all the way there. Yep. Same thing, again, it's really nice to have angle mode. Uh, what angle mode is, is an auto level mode. So normally when you're flying a freestyle drone, you're flying it in acro mode, which means that you have full control over the drone, you can hold the stick all the way, deflect it, and it will flip over. When you return the stick to center, the drone will stay at whatever angle you left it at. You have to manually put it at whatever angle in the air you want to fly it at. But with angle mode, it won't let you move the drone past a certain point. You can just kind of like hold forward and it will just stay at a constant pitch. And when you return the stick to center, the drone will return to center. So you can think of angle mode as an auto level mode. And it is nice to have on a switch so that you know, maybe in the event of a crash where it feels like you're spinning out, you can flip it and know that the drone's gonna try and level itself out. Or if you need to do like an emergency line of sight landing, it can be a lot easier to do that with an angle mode when the drone's like kind of far away. So it's, I think it's good to have angle mode on a switch. Another thing to keep in mind is you can assign multiple things to the same switch. So like what I do on my quads, I mentioned air mode earlier, uh, is I will have the same switch control the different flight modes. So I would have one position be angle mode, then I'd have the middle position be an acro mode with air mode off, and then I'd have the final position be air mode enabled. So three positions for three different flight modes. Again, we have air mode permanently enabled, so we're using this three position switch as just an on off switch. It's either acro air mode or angle mode. You'll see below angle mode is horizon mode. Don't ever use that one. It's similar to angle mode, but it will let you flip if you move the stick too far. I, I don't think it's a good idea. It teaches you bad habits. I think it's kind of unsafe. I just, if you're going to use an auto level mode, you should use angle mode, not horizon mode. Uh, moving down the list, the next one I would add is the beeper mm -hmm. uh, that we set up on the configuration for that RX set. So what switch do we use for that? Would be the back right usually. This one here? Yes. Oh so, oh, so on this radio, it's a momentary switch, right? So I can hold it up here. Just, yep. And then that's kind of nice because it only beeps when I'm holding the switch. Correct. Yeah. The last piece for modes is the flip over after crash. AKA turtle mode. If you ever hear someone refer to turtle mode, that's what Betaflight calls flip over after crash. It's a really great feature. And what it does is when you go into this mode, is it switches the directions of the motors so that you can move the pitch and roll stick 
and spin two of the motors so that you can flip the drone over without having to walk over to it. So which switch do we use for flip over? Front one right there. This one? Yep. All the way down. All the way down. There we go. Yep. And I'll just slide this over. So we've got everything set up. We hit save. Yes. And now that we've actually saved our settings, we can test them, right? Like so if I move the beeper switch, it actually starts beeping. If I move the arm switch, ah, it doesn't work. Betaflight is smart. It's not going to let you arm it. Uh, but still, even though Betaflight has these uh, safety things in place, if it messes up and lets you arm it, you better have your props off. So yeah, we've saved that. The last piece that we'll need to set up is gonna be our on-screen display. Uh, there's a couple of different ways that this works. If you have built an analog drone, what you would need to have done is intercepted the video signal wire that goes from the camera to the transmitter and soldered to the video in and video out pads on the flight controller. And what that does is it allows the flight controller to intercept the analog video signal and overlay uh, different elements on your video feed. So if you're setting up that analog system, you can uh, turn on different things that you want to show and just drag them to where you want it to be. And it will, and how you set it up on the screen will match what you see in the goggles. However, if you're setting up a digital system, things work a little bit differently. We mentioned that MSP connection. Uh, the air unit is going to use that MSP connection to generate an on-screen display uh, just using some of the information. So the air unit is going to use that MSP connection to generate on-screen display elements. Uh, but what that means is not all of these elements are uh, available. So like you can't actually have that compass thing show up. Yeah. Um, so you'll just have to play and, and see what you can actually use. But most all of the essential elements are going to work. So things yes. like your low voltage warning, your craft name. So we can go ahead and turn those on and drag them to where we want them to be. Yes. And another thing you can do is if you already have your goggles bound to the uh, to the air unit, you can uh, in real time see what's happening and make adjustments. Yeah, that's a good thing because I found that where you drag it on the display screen doesn't always line up exactly with what you see in the DJI goggles. For the drones here at Rotoriot, uh, we usually just use craft name. I bring that to the bottom. We don't want you to forget you're flying that beautiful exactly. Skyliner. <laughs> we do uh, battery voltage, which is the total voltage of your battery. Uh, I like to throw that in the top left-hand corner here. And right above that, we also do the battery average cell voltage, which mm -hmm. shows the individual uh, voltage of each cell. And for me, um, and most pilots, that's really all you need. Yeah, other things that you know, I sometimes have turned on would be like the, uh, the current value so you could actually see it full throttle. I'm drawing 90 amps, baby. Right. You'll need it. But you, know, you could also turn on maybe different timers and things like that. But I agree for the most part, it's just good to have that, uh, the, the warning thing that came on by default. Right. It'll tell you if there's some problem that it was able to detect. Uh, put on the craft name for style points and uh, your battery voltage. And that's that's all you should really need to know. But um, you can try different settings and things like that. Yeah, play around. It's all subjective. So whatever works well for you, you know, just play around and throw them in there. Once you're done, you'll just hit save. We're pretty much ready for a uh, test flight. There are some other things in here. Yeah, so there's the video transmitter tab. Now, if you're using an analog system and you're planning on using the flight controller to set the channel of your video transmitter, there's some settings that you can get into here. Yes, and it was, I know it was a big deal with older firmwares where you had to figure out your VTX table and things like that, but with these presets, they've made it really simple. Okay. You can just, a lot of cool things can happen in the presets. So yeah, thankfully we're using a digital system. We don't need to worry about that. Um, the black box tab is for setting up uh, recording black box data, which would actually give you the gyro data of a flight that you performed. And that is some, that's a tool that you use if you really want to like tune things to like super precise. Right. Um, but we don't need to do that today. This is just a basic setup. And then beyond that is the CLI tab. And so, whew, in the command line interface, this is where you can type in some very advanced settings. Um, if you do want to set up on the avatar system canvas mode, there's a couple of things that you'll need to do in the CLI, but we're not going to cover that today. We don't need to do anything in the CLI today, so this drone is this drone's ready to go, right? It is. Throw the top plate and some props on it. There we go. Now it's very, very important that you go out to an open area outdoors to do your test hover. 
So, in all seriousness, it's way better idea to do this outside, but you know, we've got the camera already set up. A safe way to test things out before actually applying any throttle is to arm your drone and don't actually add any throttle, just push forward on the pitch stick and you should see the back two motors lift up. Looking good, okay. We'll go right on the roll stick and we should see the left two motors lift up. All good there. And we can even test yaw, right? We can just give it a little bit of yaw and see it rotate. So if there were any problems, if one of the motors is spinning the wrong way, if the motor was out of order, if the sticks were assigned wrong, if the directions of the channel was incorrect, any problem at all, we would have seen it. Yes. Having done that, like 99% sure everything is good to go. So again, outside in your safe open area, you can arm the drone, give it a little bit of throttle, and there you go, we are test flying. Drone is looking good. Guys, hope you learned something today. If you did, if you had a good time, hit the like button to let us know that this helped you out. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button. Guys, I'm Ladrib. I'm Groose. And we'll see you next time on Rotor Rat. Woo! <laughs>